Okay, so uh, yep, yeah, as I said, next we have our interactive panel discussion. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator, Bahar abdul -Hay, who's the professor and director of the Toronto Intelligent Transportation System Center at the University of Toronto, Canada. And then our panelists will be Marco Marichel, Strategic uh, Communication Advisor or Connected Strategic Change uh, for Processes uh, in the Netherlands. Robert Ouellette, the founder and CEO of Mesh Cities, Toronto, Canada. Mike Branch, the Vice President of Business Intelligence at Geotab, Toronto, Canada. And Ted Graham, the Head of Open Innovation at General Motors Canada. Hello everyone, um, we're planning this in real time, so it's, uh, we'll, we'll test our abilities to do that. Um, uh, let's first start with a quick round of uh, introductions, like we go from the, the far end, Ted, and just say a few things about what you do when you're interested in, in the area of smart transportation and smart cities. Uh, so I'm Ted Graham, I'm the uh, head of open innovation at General Motors. Uh, I work with startups, incubators, and uh, university researchers on the, on the future of transportation. Um, I got started doing this uh, a few years ago when I was uh, PwC's innovation leader. Um, some of my old colleagues are in the audience, uh, and, and part of my work was to try to show them the change that were happening in regulated industries. So I actually spent uh, 99 rides as an UberX driver uh, as it was starting to get regulated uh, in those sort of messy times in 2014. Um, and since then, I've joined GM um, in part because I think that there's lots of things that we are doing to, to change the face of transportation around the world. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name's uh, Mike Branch. I'm the uh, Vice President of uh, Data and Analytics at uh, Geotab. Uh, we are the, uh, the world's second largest uh, provider of commercial uh, telematics. So we monitor about 1.1 million vehicles across uh, the globe right now. Um, and we essentially plug into your uh, car's onboard diagnostic port, and we monitor everything from, you know, uh, lawnmowers to tanks. Uh, quite a quite a, uh, a wide array of vehicles that we do monitor. Um, and and so some of the interesting uh, insights that you know we pull out of this range from you know uh, driving behavior. Um, uh, we we capture. Uh, a whole whack load of data ranging from GPS location through to uh, ambient air temperature in about a third of our vehicles. So we can plot, you know, hyperlocal maps of, uh, of weather patterns throughout the, uh, the course of uh, uh, North America and the globe. So some really interesting insights. So my role is really looking at these insights and figuring out, you know, how we can uh, leverage uh, data from a mobility perspective, working with V2X infrastructure, this kind of thing uh, at Geotab. Uh, so pleased to be here today. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert Olette, I'm the founder and uh, chief digital officer at Mesh Cities, and Mesh is an acronym that stands for Mobile uh, Efficient Subtle Human Cities. And our objective is to uh, look at who is des actually designing, and I mean that in its biggest context, the smart cities of tomorrow. Uh, and I make that distinction because what we see happening is that there are uh, intense uh, kind of focuses on very minute segments of the technologies behind smart cities and the administration behind smart cities, but very, very few people are looking at what it means to um, look at the bigger picture of design. And Mesh Cities, uh, does that. It works with cities, with companies, and, and other clients to look at that bigger picture. Good day. My name is Marco Marshall. I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm sitting with our Dutch flag. So that's the reason why I sit here. Um, I got a company in the area of smart mobility, a smart city, and what we did was a nationwide survey among citizens and stakeholders. Because we are kind of used to talk about people but not with people. And because in doing so, we get the interest of a lot of countries all over the world, from America to Australia and New Zealand. Because citizen engagement will be the most disruptive thing, despite of all technology and algorithms and everything, 
that is going to happen in the world. So why not engage them uh, and get out and ask them what they want and in which way they want it. And everybody wants to be rich, I know, and everybody wants to own their own car. Uh, but there are other interesting uh, things, and I will talk about it uh, tomorrow on my uh, presentation and with new business models uh, from different kind of companies and uh, governments. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and my name again is Beher Abdullahi. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, I've been leading the, a center known as the Intelligent Transportation System Center for the last 20 years. And last year, we started a new center called Center for Automated and Transformative Transportation Systems. Uh, and I'm going to talk all about it this afternoon, uh, later today around 4, if you're, uh, uh, if you're still around. Uh, I would like to introduce the discussion first. Um, like, as, as far as I know, transportation shapes cities. Since the dawn of the automobile 100 years or so ago, um, where we live, how we move, how big the city grows, we build suburbs, we build freeways, then, then we build transit and, and so on and so forth. All of this depending on how easy we can travel, how far we can travel, um, um, uh, and, 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 and the, the pain of uh, traveling, whether you, you're stuck in congestion or, or, or um, uh, on a transit line somewhere and so on. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that transportation shapes cities. Transportation can make or break a city. Therefore, we cannot possibly talk about smart cities without tackling the big pillar, which is uh, smart transportation um, in a city. And yes, like everybody is talking about a future of transportation that is pervasively connected, uh, automated, green, and shared, which is, are all positive things that can take us in a very good place, but can also take us, I would argue, in, like to a very ugly place where we have zombie vehicles uh, gridlocking um, the roads. So um, in your opinion, I, I just don't want to put people on the spot, just feel free to jump in. With all this innovation in technology, be it Google car or whatnot, or, or GM, the next GM uh, autonomous vehicle, and with all the innovation in service provisioning, so transportation service providing like uh, uh, the next Uber and, 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 uh, and all that, um, and the concept of mobility as a service. All these things are happening so fast. We're having a hard time, you know, understanding them, and we don't know where these things are going. So do you think we're going to a good place or not so good place? <laughs> People are running I'll away. I'll take that on. <laughs> okay. And maybe give it some context as well. Um, somebody once said that cities are the most complex machine that humankind has ever made. And you have to agree with that because so much of what we do as a species takes place in cities. Um, the remarkable thing uh, about transit in cities is that we saw in the, at the start of the 20th century a technology completely reshape the urban landscape uh, in about 20 years, about a generation, uh, which is a staggering rate of change, especially in what we could call the analog era. So what we ask ourselves at Mesh Cities is what's the, what's the equivalent technology that is about to roll down upon us that will reshape the cities of the 21st century in the same way the cities of the uh, 20th century were reshaped by cars. And I don't, you know, there are a lot of different ways of uh, framing that question, and there are a lot of technologies that you might look at, but I think we're going to be surprised what those, uh, what those solutions might be. And, and something that um, Ian Barnett mentioned uh, just before us was that, you know, we have to think, what are we, why are we doing this? What's the benefit to all of us? And uh, whatever that solution is, it's got to drive a huge amount of change, and that change has got to be positive. 
I, I just quickly kind of to add to that, you know, um, I, I think we can all, um, we're, we all get, tend to get focused on the technology and the, the solution to the problem as it re revolves around technology, but we can't, you know, lose focus on the individual. And I, I really do think from a data economy perspective that it's important for the data to remain as, as open uh, as possible and uh, for those pipelines to be, uh, uh, you know, developed uh, by cities for um, entrepreneurs to come in and leverage the data and the technology in a way that makes a, a, a lot of sense it, for it not to be locked away. So open city, open platform, open data is, is crucial. And, um, uh, and I think the cities who can uh, best leverage that while still keeping in mind what we're going to do from um, you know, the human perspective will be the ones that, that kind of win. So you and I have had some discussions like this over coffee, and so it's it's nice to do it on the stage for once. You know, I'm one of um, sort of a, a new generation of people in a what used to be known solely as a car company to to try to rethink this idea of could we measure ourselves more on kilometers enjoyed than vehicles sold, and and that's a major shift for a company like ours. Um, we have a, a brand that we launched in Toronto recently, Maven, um, and the whole idea of Maven in a city like Toronto is to take 10 cars off the road for every one car share that we have in the city. Um, I'm one of those people that have suffered from congestion in my own city. Uh, my old office was at the corner of York and Bremner, um, so if you know when the when the Blue Jays let out and there's Comic-Con at the convention center and the Raptors are playing, there's a perfect storm where you can't even walk across the street. Like, there's just enough people congestion moving around that area. Uh, and we held a decongestion hackathon to try to bring together different voices to solve for that. And it was, it was interesting because at the time, you know, Uber was sharing no data uh, with the city. They're now starting to as part of the Uber movement program. Um, but, you know, in those early days, we brought together public policy folks, designers, technologists, to try to take a multifaceted view of this. And, you know, I'm, I'm more encouraged by some of these um, smart city um, collaborations where there's this openness to partnering private and public sector. Um, and, you know, maybe as part of this panel discussion, I, I see some of these submissions in there that could have some injection on transportation, even the, you know, when we talk about the Toronto Tower communities and access to jobs in a wider circle, how is that going to be enabled? So I think there's lots of places to plug into some of these smart cities and really articulating the transportation vision that will be more heaven than hell. Well, it took me some time to think about the question, and that's why I gave away the microphone. Um, when you look at the end user, um, you, you will find a couple of things. Sometimes you want to go uh, to Toronto or uh, to Niagara Falls because you've got a business, business meeting, you want to get there quick. And sometimes you want to have fun on the road uh, because you go to an amusement park like Disney or uh, other parks. So it depends on the need of uh, uh, the, the citizens and the people and the transport and the mobility is part of that. Um, and when I go uh, to amusement park and I got a lot of, with, with the family, a lot of time, I can get a bicycle or I get a, a, a nice, great car. But when I want to go really fast, um, and last week I was in the first uh, um, sitting, in the first helicopter that also is uh, a driving, so the first driving uh, a helicopter, you can drive it yourself if you got 500,000 euros or 750,000 uh, um, Canadian dollars, then you can buy one. And you can, can go there by yourself and it will take you 30, 40, 50 minutes. Can you, you can also share it. So transport is not the goal, it's, it's, it's it's part of the journey you will have and the need that you want. And you also need real-time data and information to get there. 
I just wanted to double click on something that Ted said as well too. Um, in creating these, uh, you know, th these partnerships, I, I think I'm starting to see more and more often now, which is is nice to see these partnerships between private, uh, between uh, public, and also the universities and and uh, from an R and D perspective. So some of the things that you know we've tried to do, and you know, you talk about hackathons and this kind of thing. We we pushed a lot of our our data out there open for free um, and I've been surprised by some of the things that come out of it and you don't see um, uh, you know the light bulb turn on right away but it's I think through a lot of persistence so uh, just as an example you know we released um, a hazardous driving areas data set free for charge you can access through Google BigQuery on on our platform and and we had this hackathon that we ran at the University of Toronto and, and so uh, you know, 150 or so students were just leveraging this hazardous driving areas data set to figure out what can they figure out from it. Um, and these are first year students, right? Um, so they did a correlation analysis to look at hazardous driving areas in municipalities all across Canada and they determined that there was an unusually high incident of uh, hazardous driving areas in some rural uh, areas of, uh, of Newfoundland. So they wonder, well, why, why is this? They, they correlated it then, those areas, with um, moose vehicular accidents and, and found an interesting correlation. This was something that, you know, first year students were able to do. So not saying that this is, you know, uh, the light bulb that is going to, uh, you know, take us, make a city become that much more smarter or effective, but it, it's those first steps, I think, towards these partnerships that where data is being exposed, research is being done, collaboration is happening at multiple levels. I think these are important building blocks to help us get to where we need to go. Right, excellent. I just want to pick up on your point that uh, uh, we don't travel for the sake of traveling, but rather we want to do activities. It's the experiences that we engage in, whether I go to work, I go shopping, and set, take my kids to school, and so on. But a fundamental like law and transportation, if you will, is that how far you travel reaching out to those activities depends on the cost or generalized cost. I would call it the pain index, like a time, your time budget, your money budget, um, your frustration budget, like sitting in congestion and, yeah. and, and whatnot. So there is an argument out there with driving automation, for instance, that the pain of driving will be taken away. People will have much less sense of time or value on time. Uh, they don't suffer from being in a car for two hours. I'll watch a movie while or, or do my emails and so on, which may prompt people to live farther out, may uh, feed urban sprawl. I may go to the dentist and, and not park and ask my car to go around the block 20 times while I'm done, until I'm done. So there is a, like, how do we deal with those unintended intended consequences? We've seen this morning that sometimes the unintended consequences can be catastrophic. So uh, how, how to kind of grab the bull by the horn and make sure this doesn't happen? Anyone? Well, we got a problem. Because in my, this is one of my fantasies, and I asked this question in the survey to thousands of, uh, of people and said, well, for example, uh, uh, you live in Toronto, and you go to Ottawa, and you got a self-driving car, uh, would you get even further? And 68% said, no, I don't want to get any further. Um, I just want to stick in the neighborhood and in the area. So the question is, is it going to happen? We think it's going to happen, but we not actually are not sure. Do you guys agree? <laughs> uh, so the, the person who's actually been in the back of our self-driving car might as well answer this question. Um, we've, uh, we've made some announcements in the last few months that our self-driving car efforts is uh, driven by a shared model, so a, what we call a robo-taxi model. Um, and really concentrated into um, large cities. We, we believe that 60% of the world's population will live in these mega cities by 2030. Um, and we don't believe that contributing to urban sprawl is a good thing either. And, and I think that the concentration of the business model that makes sense for companies like ours will be to servicing um, sort of all of the different kind of use cases within the, the core in being a complement to mass transit. Um, we're also developing it on a platform while 
all of our AVs, our autonomous vehicles, will be EVs, electric vehicles. And so we're also trying to figure out how do we contribute to zero emissions in terms of that downtown core driving. Other companies are, are pursuing um, personally owned autonomous that, that may be part of a future, but much, much longer away. Um, and I think we have some time to kind of figure out, you know, what will be the sort of, if there is one, a congestion charge like there is in London and elsewhere that will maybe mitigate your desire to, to live farther out and have your car running around in a zombie mode, as you said. Um, but, you know, I, I think we, we also share the concern that, you know, is there inevitability that, like my teenage twins, you know, are they going to stay home and Netflix and chill all the time? Or will they actually get out and see the world? Um, we saw when Lyft put the prices of what they call Lyft line or pooled rides to about $5 to get to anywhere in San Francisco, the actual um, economic development of the city in terms of restaurant, theater, musical performances rose during that period. People, that was the sort of tipping point to get people out and actually partaking in businesses. And I hope that is one of the outcomes of, of trying to enable more efficient, cheaper transportation. Is anyone else kind of worried that we're up here and they tested the emergency uh, alert system? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that some kind of weird, pathetic fallacy uh, for what the importance of what we're talking about? I think it is. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was on a panel like this one at the United Nations in New York with uh, some really incredible designers uh, and thinkers around what was happening with cities of uh, tomorrow. And the great thing about the UN is you, you know, hear firsthand from people who are dealing with issues that, you know, boggle a Torontonian's mind, like we, we don't have the, near the problems some cities have. And if I look at incentives for global change, certainly smart cities and the transits, the smart transit systems that come along with them are going to make a huge difference. Probably less so here in Toronto, but in places like, you know, Delhi or Mexico City or other places, it's, it's going to be huge. So the drivers for systemic change are there because the need is there. What the changes will be, that's really the question. And that's, I mean, that's what excites me, that we, we're at this, you know, uh, a tipping point uh, of change. And, you know, anyone in this room could be the person or have the idea that it's going to make a huge difference. Uh, I think to, to again um, harp on that, uh, we are at such an, uh, a pivotal point, I think, where the technologies are just there and are ripe for a lot of uh, incredible innovation and that we couldn't have done, you know, uh, a few years back. Um, you look at uh, uh, cellular V2X and DSRC and all the potential, and you combine that with, uh, you know, uh, the incredible speeds we're getting, the analysis that we can do from a data perspective, it, it's just tremendous. And so I think we're a long way, although, you know, having said that, I think we're a long ways away from, you know, the fully uh, autonomous vehicle being ubiquitous across the board where I can just sit in my, uh, you know, vehicle in uh, and live in, in Barrie and drive it to Toronto every single day and just, you know, uh, hang out while doing work. That, I think that is a long ways away. Um, but I think we're, we're building toward that with a lot of the, the technology that we are putting in place in our cities right now. Uh, and, and that's really exciting. You know, the possibility of, uh, you know, we look at um, freight movement, you know, within city and allowing for that to be a little bit more efficient. How often have you been, you know, sitting behind, you know, a class eight heavy duty truck in the middle of the city and uh, you know it gets to go through the green light, and you're stuck behind there just because it takes forever for it to get started. Well, you know, would it make sense for those lights to be preempted a little bit, and you know, uh, instead of being stuck behind it, it you know extends the light by you know 
five, 10, 20 seconds so that you know it allows for more efficient movement of traffic. And these are technologies that are, are here today, right? So I think these kinds of things, these incremental changes will eventually get us there, set the stage for uh, fully AV, you know, I think the years from now when it does come to play. Well, thank you, actually, give me an, uh, a good segue into my next question. Ha happy to do that. <laughs> Well, congestion that we all suffer from and complain about is simple to understand. Hard to solve, yes, but simple to understand. You have you know, demand, how many people are, how many of us are buzzing around and moving around uh, uh, over capacity of the system, how many roads, how many transit lines we have. So when demand exceeds capacities, we have congestion, as simple as that. The problem is demand keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. Populations are growing, people are more active, participating in 100 million different things a day, and so on. So demand is uncapped, while capacity is capped. We, we capped financially, capped by space constraint, capped by environmental constraints, and so on. So the expectation, and sorry to be the bearer of bad news, is that congestion will get worse, and or potentially may get worse. So for us to in really do something about it, uh, it's like conceptually it's not rocket science. Either we have to manage demand or boost capacity, right? So let's talk about both. Let's start with the demand side first. With smart technologies and, and, and whatnot, there is potential for that demand to kind of mushroom. What needs to be put in place to kind of put the lid on it and make it wise, like you mentioned, for instance, car sharing, I mean, uh, ride, ride sharing as a possibility, other ideas, like what can we do to make sure that we, we just, not all of us drive um, in, in autonomous cars and half the cars are empty, the other half is, you know, ride hailers or ride, ride providing companies that are running around looking for customers. So how do we manage demand? I, I, I'll, maybe I'll just extend a little bit on um, some of what I had kind of just talked about. Um, uh, so when we're looking at infrastructure within the cities, um, traffic control and, and this kind of thing, I think one of the things that we can do to manage demand to a certain extent um, is to uh, allow these, allow the flow in a more efficient way uh, wherever wherever we can. There, and there are models that you can look at and you can create uh, whereby, uh, again, if you have over, you know, less than 10% freight vehicle activity within a specific intersection or corridor, maybe I start lighting up that corridor. Maybe there's a potential for a cost recovery model for a city to do these kinds of things. Hazardous materials coming through a city, I know uh, that they might be hazardous. Well, you know, can I light up that corridor while still maintaining the traffic flow in an efficient way? So I think there are, there are things from a vehicle to infrastructure infrastructure communication perspective that can be done to to help lessen the um, uh, you know um, the load on on the city and those are some of the things that we're, we're looking at right now I would, I would argue that this is on the supply side like you're trying to enhance the efficiency of the system which was like the second part of the question we didn't get to yet like I'm more worried about the number of cars on the road getting out of hand so I I, I see this, you know, from a, a few lenses. I, I grew up on the west side of Cape Breton Island uh, in a community, you know, smaller than Lethbridge. The person from Lethbridge is still here. Um, and, you know, population 800. There was, but we had our own local entertainment. It was basically your kitchen, and you would have fiddlers and dancers come in. And I actually think we're seeing somewhat of a resurgence of this sort of hyper-local, whether it's in your condo common room or it's house concerts of a different kind in communities. Um, I'm an investor in a startup that does exactly that, that's trying to find these sort of like local events. Uh, so I think that will be one part of the supply side. I think you'll start reaching a tipping point where, as I said, if the Air Canada Centre and the Rogers Centre and everything is occupied, you just, you, you'll choose not to go down there that day. And so, you know, maybe part of it is the awareness of the things that are around you and you know better digital literacy and transparency of you know really quality local events um, but you're right there's gonna be a tipping point to like how much of a sort of a shoulder sh to shoulder experience do I want to watch 
together um, versus trying to find things that are that are more hyper local. Um, and, and I think there will be a sort of a congestion tax pricing, time of use pricing that will need to be uh, installed to, to mitigate that at some point. I was I, there was to pull that out of you. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I once advocated for a um, uh, free subway at 6 a.m. You know, if you think about all of the, you know, people who for whatever non-economic reason choose to travel around the most congestion times, could you actually save some money on building, you know, more lines by actually making it near free at certain, where people, not everybody can choose to travel at that time, but if they could, moving people out along the times of the day. The other part of this question, uh, get aw getting away from the kind of the engineering and supply side, is the communication side. If you look at uh, Toronto as a good example, uh, we could today have a pretty well fully functioning transit system based on a plan that was unveiled, what, 10 or 12 years ago now. But because of politics, we're ending up with a very expensive five or six billion dollar one-stop subway system, which makes no sense in the context of the transit issues that this community faces. But here we are. How do we take that question on? I think, I think there are perhaps a dozen ways of answering the question f just from an efficiency perspective, like you build fewer roads, build better transit. There are a lot of different solutions that are out there uh, under best practices, but it's getting communities to agree on a solution. That's where we have to spend a lot more time. That's the price of democracy, I guess, like the, the downside of it. So let me finish this question by saying that I'm going to solve your problem. <laughs> we can all go home now. Uh, or go to the hotel, in my case. So I think it's, it's about two things. Um, most people who live in villages really like to live in villages, and they go to the city to work. Um, so that is, is, is a lot of traffic and traffic jams. So I, I'm staying in uh, uh, the Marriott, in the city center of uh, Toronto. I want to come over here, and it took me one hour uh, by cab to get here. And of course, there are other means uh, uh, to get here by train or by metro, as the cab driver uh, explained to me. Um, shall I drop you off here on the right? But anyway, um, so you you when you got those people living in the villages, you got more work in the villages um, and in that area, they don't need to go out and go to the city or live in the city because they really love living in, in, in the villages. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is mobility as a service. It's, I know it's a term, uh, uh, but as the end user, as I was saying, and I got real-time data and information, and I got different kind of mobility forms um, that advise me which uh, route I can take and which mobility form I can take with one payment system, then I can get on my way quite easy. Um, and, and that's one of the, the things uh, uh, I think that people really want uh, uh, to do that. But there's another part, um, as humans, uh, we have a certain kind of habits and we got a certain kind of behavior and that is really a big problem because the car is outside and we want to get in the car uh, even though there are a lot uh, traffic jams and you know that uh, in advance, uh, people still get in. Thank you. Um, so still congestion is a problem, right? We haven't solved it yet. And, and there is the okay. demand <laughs> side. <laughs> There is the demand side and then there is the supply side or, or the capacity of the infrastructure. So here's a question to, to you guys in the audience. Like, look ahead 20 years from now. All vehicles are automated. You're not driving anything. Um, um, uh, there, there isn't even a steering wheel in the car. Do you think the capacity of the freeway will increase 
or drop. I'll tell you right now that you know the capacity on the Gardner, let's say, let's say 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane. Each lane carries 2,000 vehicles per hour. When things are, where cars are automated, do you think this will be higher or lower? If you think it's higher, raise your hand. Not a whole lot. Lower? Not a whole lot either. What about the rest? <laughs> <laughs> They're skeptic. <laughs> well, I would argue that both are possibilities. Like, uh, if, you, if you have an adaptive cruise control in your car today, it is set to adopt about two-second headway between your car and the car ahead of you. And while a human driver uses about 1.3 to 1.5 seconds, which means that if overnight all cars have adaptive cruise control, which is like partial automation, then the capacity of the freeway will drop significantly. You will lose about 20, 30, 40 percent of the capacity of the road, which is contrary to what we all hope for. But if you drive down the headway to about 0.8 seconds, you can double the capacity of the infrastructure. Let's say increase it by 50% or so. So that what I'm getting at here is that um, what we do is technology. The technology is like a, a tool in your hand. How you use it, you can make things better or you can make things worse. So for example, if, we, if the infrastructure communicates to the vehicles, and tells the vehicles that you're approaching congestion right now, you need to adopt shorter headway or you need to slow down. So the infrastructure can manage the vehicle fleet to, to reduce congestion and increase the efficiency and, 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 and so on and so forth, which would require that the infrastructure talks to the vehicle. Now, there is a compliance issue. There is privacy issue, there is cyber security issue. So what do you guys think of those simple issues? <laughs> <laughs> so to unpack a few of those things, um, you know, I, I agree with you on the, on the headway issue. I, I've actually been pitched by a few people who have uh, cottages uh, in Muskoka that we should have a uh, uh, AV-led train on one of the lanes up the 400 and all the adaptive cruise control could be set for a very small limit and you would allow those if there are green vehicles up that way. I think much better to focus in on heavily trafficked commuter zones than people's cottages, but um, I, I do think that that is a, a big problem to solve. On the, on the cybersecurity angle, I'll just I'll take a, a point there. Um, we, one of the things that we're doing today is using your, your phone as a, an ability to unlock cars for car sharing. So our Maven cars, you basically are, you know, you don't need to hold anything up to the window or anything like that. You're unlocking the car and the personalized settings. Um, but that requires a certain amount of cybersecurity built in. And we're on this continuum of that level of cybersecurity all the way up to you know, preventing you know, quantum computers from breaking into a transportation network. Um, we've hired one of the best white hat hackers uh, in Dr. Charlie Miller, who famously hacked a Jeep on 60 Minutes, and um, we, we figured there was no better way to go to the source than some, somebody like that who's a you know, great academic researcher who knows how to you know, find all of the vulnerabilities and, and work hard on that. And, and I think that's what's driving a lot of our partnerships across this industry. Um, you know, we're talking to people who, you know, we would have been fighting tooth and nail with before to try to resolve any kind of cybersecurity vulnerabilities. But um, for my friends at, at, at Geotab here, you know, you probably know more than many people that, you know, those dongles that some of the insurance companies give you or, you know, random companies are giving you to plug in there, there is much more cybersecurity around that in cars and people need to be aware of, you know, trusting the source of, of where that monitoring comes from. Um, but I think as part of this whole conversation, I think understanding how we talk to emergency vehicles, how do we talk to um, the, the lights, all of those things will become preeminent in, in really, you know, not too long from now. It's, it's even before we get to the stage, uh, even communicating that there's black ice ahead and things like that. 
Yeah, I think it's certainly crucial in, in you know, uh, in everything that we do. I think the problem is, too, it's a little bit uh, uh, the, the Wild West out there from a standardization perspective as well, too, and um, in understanding, you know, um, you know, from the, the, from the aftermarket device perspective, you know, what are the standards and the protocols uh, that need to be applied, you know, uh, across the board for access to this vehicular data? Um, and there aren't, you know, uh, there isn't a set approach to it. And I, I, th I feel that it certainly does need to, uh, to come into standardization across, uh, across the board. Um, obviously, one of the things that we certainly do uh, well, I think, is um, over-the-air updates on all of our devices is something that is completely, uh, you know, is something that we uh, that we make sure is uh, available for all of our devices. We uh, employ white hat hackers as well too, is, is something that's absolutely crucial to making sure that you know um, we have the most secure uh, systems uh, that there are out there. Um, but it isn't something that you can take for granted uh, at all. Uh, it's something that constantly has to be monitored, dedicated security teams um, uh, at all of these, um, uh, at institutions like Geotab. Um, so it's, I mean, it's crucially important, but standardization uh, of, this ve of vehicular data, of how we interact with it, that needs to be, um, that needs to be worked on a lot more right now. Mesh Cities has a, has a blog site and uh, we write kind of extensive essays on a lot of these kinds of questions. And one, one other uh, frame of this is that uh, the, in many parts of the world, people are not uh, learning how to drive. So the demand is dropping, especially with millennials. So perhaps uh, given the Uberization of everything and Ford getting out of the car business and I, I don't know what GM is thinking of doing, um, maybe that problem is just going to go away. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, as a country, the Netherlands is a great country because we uh, conducted uh, tests uh, on public uh, roads with the self-driving cars, cooperative system, connected cars. Uh, and I was in each one of them uh, just to find out because it's also about an experience. And what you see is that hacking is one of the great issues uh, people are concerned about. But what, what surprised me is that sharing data and information for the better good, so uh, against traffic jams and against uh, 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 digestions uh, on, the, on the public uh, road, uh, they don't care. They just don't care. They want to share it. Uh, because in that way, sharing that data and information, they can get quite easy uh, uh, to their destination. So that was not an issue um, uh, on, that, uh, on that point, uh, but it's also about experience and about uh, seduction. Okay, well, I give you that the Netherlands is a very interesting place. You guys are ahead of many, many other places in the world and you're engaging. Thank you. You're engaging, like you're doing I will the tell work. The king. <laughs> so you're gonna invite me over? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. So like, I, I, what I'm trying to say here is that um, here's a personal experience. I'll share it without naming the brand of the car. I was in a car on adaptive cruise control following the, the vehicle ahead of it. And then all of a sudden, I can see it. I was not driving, but I can see what is happening down the stream. Um, traffic suddenly stopped. So it's like boom, boom, boom. All cars like slow down until the turn of my car came and the car started to break harshly, but at the same time started screaming at me, beeping and yelling and doing this and that for me to take over control. So for, for a second, uh, I got confused. I said like, what the heck, like, what, am I, what am I supposed to do? Like, you're about to crash and you're handing the car over to, to me. Crash so, by yourself. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, sorry I cannot drive, you crash in the vehicle ahead of you. So, do, do you guys know what we're supposed to what do in a situation? <laughs> Not Dutch. <laughs> do you know what's supposed to happen in a situation like this? Uh-oh. <laughs> so, this, this is a great question. Um, insurance companies actually offer uh, a deduction if you have automatic emergency braking. 
So many of these cars that offer adaptive cruise control also uh, offer uh, automatic emergency braking. Most people don't know that that works until you absolutely need it to work. Um, and the, but you're right, the sort of cognitive load of you needing to take over at that point is really why automatic emergency braking is in place. And, it, uh, and take over what? Take over crashing or like it, no no it'll it'll break it will it will break that car for you right like it, it will apply the brakes for you okay. whether if if you're going to intercede maybe there's something you need to be aware of and you know all of these we're actually now doing driver monitoring systems in terms of did that person have a diabetic attack is there something happening Are, because there's going to need to be some redundancies and fail safes in all of these levels of autonomy. Um, and, and one of them is sort of, but the expectations on the driver of handing over after, let's say, three or four hours of nearly automated driving doesn't make a ton of sense. And there's a lot of debate about sort of what needs to be in place. Um, but I can tell you one of the things that we're seeing in the, in the car share business is that, you know, our newer fleet of vehicles that have things like um, automatic braking, especially for people who maybe have their driver's license but haven't used it in 10 years, like you're seeing, you know, people who got it when they were 16, live downtown, too expensive to park a car downtown, and now all of a sudden they're driving again. So, and with all the distracted drivers, all of these features and the sensing and warnings and things like that have become not a nice to have, but almost a must have for people who aren't driving as much as, you know, maybe we did when we were growing up. Um, I, I think we were meant to take some questions from the audience, so I don't want to preempt okay. your moderator role, but... Uh. Okay, that's, I, I, I don't see anybody. I see <laughs> lights in my eyes. So, um, questions from the floor. Okay. Go back to the hard questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a nice way to dodge the questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. Thanks for sharing. Um, just was curious because uh, Netherlands is um, Netherlands is quite ahead in some aspects um, around energy use, sustainability, and um, zero emissions sometimes on the road and lighting and things like that. I was wondering if you could share uh, a couple of stories um, in the recent past where um, you've worked on things that are um, quote unquote smart initiatives and s some things lessons that you can share uh, perhaps here today. Sure. Um, thank you for your question. I didn't get your name, uh, David. Um, so the most important thing um, is that as a country, uh, I think about five or six years ago, the government said we're going to be the smartest area country in the world in the area of smart mobility. So that's the first thing you really need to have, a nationwide government that gets out and sticks his head out, and then all other uh, authorities and governments and businesses uh, uh, tackle along and go with that, along with a huge case of uh, money. Uh, that helps also. Um, so what we are testing in the Netherlands is especially self-driving cars on the public, uh, uh, on the public road. Um, but it's not always that successful, so let's be uh, honest. So when you got a self-driving uh, shuttle on the airport, different kind of airport areas there are in the, the Netherlands, then it will work out fine. On the public roads, it's still an issue because uh, um, the sensors are very sensitive. So when, when some water or a couple of leaves are, are flowing, it will stop. So it will need uh, uh, more time. Uh, even though we got to get there, it's a Dutch company who makes self-driving uh, cars and shuttles and also sell them to uh, to Dubai. Uh, they got, got a major order, uh, uh, I think, two weeks ago. The other thing um, that's go going around is uh, mobility as a service. 
So introducing mobility as a service to the Dutch uh, people and getting, it's also facilitated by the nationwide government and getting them in line to have the profiles for the end user, that's what, where I come in. And you got in the middle the real time data and information and the payment system and on the other side, the different kind of uh, mobility forms. Because we are, as a country, we are just like a little stamp, but we are with 70 million people. So that's a lot of people in a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, area. And so that's why it's, it's work, um, even, uh, uh, and also electrical uh, cars. Car sharing, ride sharing is still an issue uh, because people don't want to share uh, a ride uh, on, unless it's Uber uh, or want to share their own car. So that's that's a little bit of a problem. There's a couple of the highlights, except for the connected cars and the cooperative uh, systems, uh, which is the government pretty much investing in different kind of systems throughout the country. There was a, I think there was a question there, yeah. A couple of hands are up. If we have a few minutes so you can jump ahead the question right away, please. Sorry, okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering, this is Rafik uh, Ali, I was wondering, um, there was a mention of uh, infrastructure communicating with cars and cars having intelligence to react. What role do you see as likes of Google, so you know, who have, um, who, who capture data on us and have a very good um, idea of what the congestion is which we all use these days? Uh, and uh, vehicle-to-vehicle communications, not just sensing it, but actually having conversations, intelligent conversations between a car ahead of you in terms of solving these congestion problems. Anybody from the panel? So if I, I can repeat back the question so I, I understand it. Um, so you're talking about the the other data, whether it's a ways or the crowdsource data on sort of usage patterns and things like that. Um, you know, I, I think that there's there's an increasing amount of sensors that we're, we're putting either in intersections but also on vehicles. And there's a bit of a an interesting point at which, you know, cities are debating whether to rip up an intersection and put in sort of a million dollars worth of sensors under the, um, the asphalt, or are there more passive ways that things that are already going to be there, you know, in the same way that we scan our own checks for the bank now, they used to pay somebody to do that, now I do that on behalf of the bank, uh, take a picture of it, so using ways is another way that you are supplying information to the city. Um, a lot of the, the, the vehicles, more modern vehicles, have a number of cameras on them, so they're not only going to be able to look at the speed that it's traveling, they can tell you the nature of maybe a stoppage in front of it, so it can tell you whether it is a, is it a city bus, is it a delivery truck, so that you might be able to sort of unlock the, the nature of the jam. So I, I, I am very interested in these sort of passive sources of information, um, but you know, in the same thing that we've we've seen in the sidewalk debate is that, you know, how do we do it carefully and we, we protect uh, data where we're flushing this information um, after we kind of get the sort of information about moving people along and how do we protect identities. Um, so I think that's going to be this balance that we need to strike. Yeah, a quick comment there. I think you, you asked about uh, vehicle to infrastructure, or I mean infrastructure to vehicle communication versus vehicle to vehicle communication. Uh, very quickly, like if you, you're telling a vehicle fleet, for instance, to adopt certain headway, how short that headway can be, that depends on the capability of the car. If the car is autonomous, like completely autonomous, like a Google car or, or whatnot, then there is a limit because there is latency in when you detect the vehicle ahead of you and how can you react to it and so on. But if the vehicles are talking to each other, as using dedicated short-range communication, then you can cut down the headway much shorter and hence increase the capacity of the system much higher. Maybe double, sometimes people talk about triple. Okay, I think we're running out of time. There's more on this, 425, stick around. <laughs> uh, if you could uh, share, me, share with me, thanking the panel, thank you very much.